Hi book friends, I'm Erin, and this is Erin Go Read. So I hope you're all having a nice beginning of April. Uh, we still have rain here in Northern California. I am so tired of it. I am ready for weeks and months of sunshine. Before we begin with the books that I read in the second half of the month, I'm just going to go over some stats for the books for all of March. Um, I will link part one of the March wrap up. And in the month of March, I read 11 books, four of those were audiobooks, and two, two of them were from uh, the Great American Read Project. I read one middle grade, one classic, one short story, one mystery th thriller, one fantasy, three literary fiction, and three historical fiction. So kind of all over the board there with a lot of literary and historical fiction, which eh, that's probably about par for my normal. I had um, two three-star books, six four-star books, and three five-star books. The first book I'm going to talk about is Unsheltered by Barbara King Solver. I read this primarily via audiobook. It was a really good audiobook production. Um, this follows, it's historical fiction. We have dual timelines and uh, sets of people. So these timelines are about 150 years apart and they are tied together by their residents. So they live in like a pre-planned community and there was kind of, it was almost like a cultish kind of following where it, uh, it started off in the late 1800s of this community that was established by this man and he had all these ideals about, um, it's almost like a utopian, uh, it reminds me of like that movie Pleasantville um, of uh, these high moral people living in um, by specific um, kind of codes of conduct um, in, in this area. So we follow a current day couple and their adult children and um, what life brings about um, in this house that they have inher inherited in this old community and it is falling apart and it's it's like they've they're struggling because this this middle-aged couple who has adult children now has done everything right in life they've gone to college they've had worked hard in their professional careers and continue to do so and are in a house that's falling down. They don't have enough money to, to fix it up in, a, in any livable uh, way. And the wife is trying to, because it is part of this historic community, she's trying to see if she can get some sort of um, historical recognition, some sort of grant to help them get this house to be habitable. So she does some digging uh, into the history of the house and that brings us to our early timeline. So Thatcher, who is a professor at the local college, and he befriends the next door neighbor who turns out to be Mary Treat. Now Mary Treat is an actual historical figure. She was a uh, scientist and she was in direct communication via uh, letter with Charles Darwin. And so Thatcher, as a man of science and a, a, a professor, is very interested in Mary Treat and her work. The first time they meet, he goes into her house and she has her finger inside of a Venus flytrap um, because she's studying um, like what it's going to do. Um, and um, so they establish this great relationship and, and bond through their love of science. And he's like, is blown away that she's in contact with Charles Darwin, but because of the community that they live in and the the times and the this is like the 1870s, um, the idea of of evolution of animals becoming extinct of evolving over time is really challenging to the um, the religious minded people in this community. And Thatcher has to be very careful about what he teaches to his students and um, that kind of sets off his, his storyline. So in the past timeline, our characters are confronted with this beginning of a paradigm shift where we have a creation-only view and then we have the works of scientists like Char Charles Darwin and Mary Treat who are bringing evidence to, uh, to the, who are bringing evidence to the forefront to challenge the beliefs of the creationists. 
in the present timeline. We have this couple I said who has done everything right, they have worked hard their whole lives, they're highly educated, and they still feel like they are they might as well be their 20 and 30 something kids. So they have their two adult children and they're struggling in a very similar way, particularly the son. The very beginning of the book, the son's wife commits suicide shortly after she's given birth to their baby son. And so now he is in pieces, his life is in pieces, there's a young baby to be taken care of. So he moves home with his parents and they help take care of the baby. and. Uh, the adult daughter is also at home and so the four of these adults are taking care of this baby and the parents and the adult children are very much kind of in the same place now the daughter is a bit of an outsider as far as her choices in life she had lived in Costa Rica and um, she didn't follow the typical go to college get a job get married path like her brother did and uh, maybe that was a better choice. Um, we don't know. And so we explore the dynamics of this family. Um, I particularly like the mother and the daughter's relationship and how it starts off kind of frosty. And as particularly the mother gets to know the daughter more, she gets a better understanding of who her daughter is and respects her, um, gains, gains respect for her that she's never had before. I really enjoyed it. I really feel like I could see these people living their lives, this house, particularly in the current day timeline, I felt like I could picture this house that was falling down and I felt very attached to, the, to these characters and what would become of them. So I gave this four stars and I'm very excited to get to the Poisonwood Bible this month. So we have another book with Awesome Ladies of Science, and this is Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier. So this is the fictionalized story of the actual women, Mary Anning and Elizabeth Philpot. So Elizabeth Philpot is a, uh, this is during the Regency era, era in England, the early 1700s. Elizabeth and her two sisters are basically sent off to Lyme Regis to live a comfortable life. Their brother sends them 150 pounds a year and they uh, will they be spinsters? Will they find love in the small town of Lyme Regis? Um, they each have different um, ideas, obviously, and um, and uh, different things that they want from life. So Elizabeth is quite interested in fossils, and she ends up coming across this young girl, Mary Anning, and Mary Anning, who was hit by lightning as a young child, has the eye and she can spot these fossilized skeletons and these fossils better than anyone can and whereas Elizabeth comes from a bit of money and uh, dressing well and good manners and uh, education are very important for her Mary and her family are just trying to get by her father is a furniture maker and they collect these curies or curiosities, these fossils, to sell, they clean them up and they sell them to, to tourists in order to make extra money for the family. Well, the father ends up dying quite early and the family is left even more destitute. The brother, um, the brother is now essentially taking care of his mother and sister and Mary is becoming a, more and more a prodigious fossil hunter and she, the actual Mary Anning, and as well as in the story, finds the first full fossilized skeleton of the Ichthyosaurus and the Plesiosaurus, and maybe I'm saying those right. So uh, Elizabeth and Mary become friends over this, and Elizabeth, with her high education and she's higher class, she kind of tutors Mary a bit in in the ways of the world and kind of being more professional in her fossil finding business essentially. So this is a story of the friendship of Mary and Elizabeth and when things go well and things don't go well, love and loss. It's about class. Um, we have Elizabeth and kind of her higher brow circles that she runs in which become important for Mary's kind of scientific career to, to take off as Elizabeth is taken much more seriously than Mary would be. And we see, again, like in 
unsheltered with Mary Treat, we have the challenging of the religious status quo with these fossils. So if we have fossils of animals that no longer exist on this earth, was God sovereign in that? What does it mean if God created an animal that is no longer here? And so the people at this time uh, don't have basically a, a theology that is holding up to um, these new scientific discoveries. So it is quite difficult and challenging for many people to accept. Um, they, they, rather than, we'll, we kind of know ichthyosaurus, plesiosaurus, well, those are dinosaurs, but at the time they just refer to it as the crocodile. And they're thinking of, they're trying to basically, whiny dog, they're basically trying to um, ex find ways to explain away how this could be something that is making them feel uncomfortable. This was a really great read. I'm really looking forward to reading more Tracy Chevalier. I actually just found out that there's a new Tracy Chevalier book. Um, what's it called? Something about a thread um, that uh, is coming out, it either came out or is coming out very soon. So I think I have two more Chevaliers on my shelf. So uh, I'm glad that I found a new author that I really enjoyed. I gave this four stars. The final historical fiction of the month is Transcription by Kate Atkinson. This is my second Kate Atkinson. I read Life After Life, I think in January, and really enjoyed it. I think she's one of my new favorite authors. So Kate, uh, Transcription, we have a dual timeline following our main character, Juliet. So the present day timeline, Juliet works for the BBC in radio production. And we follow kind of her reminiscing about her past during World War II, where she was recruited to spy for MI5. So her job was to transcribe conversations that were happening uh, across the hall from uh, Nazi sympathizers um, and Nazi supporters. And so we get a lot of the backstory of what happened during the war and all the characters that were involved in that. And then now in her present day, that time in her life with MI5 is catching up with her. I love Kate Atkinson's writing. Um, this is the second book I've read. And so, so far out of the two that I've read, one of my favorite things is these little, just like witty thoughts that the main character will have that we're privy to. And it's just like it had me laughing in my car, just little giggles at just these little, these little humor bombs that she's that she drops. I felt like I was Julia's confidant as she is telling us the story in the past and telling us, relating to us what's happening in the uh, in the current day. And I just really enjoyed it. I think I actually would have enjoyed this more if I had read the physical book. I listened to this on audiobook, and there were so many characters particularly male characters who were quite similar. There wasn't a great deal of differentiation in my mind as to which male character was which. And then, you know, they would bring up someone's name. I'm like, is that the guy that, oh, which one, which one was that? So I think that probably would have been a little bit more clear if I was reading the physical book rather than the audio book. So it did kind of take me out of the story as I would kind of have to wait for the context to make it clear which make male character, um, she was interacting with, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to more Kate Atkinson in my life. This is The Lonesome Bodybuilder by Yukika Matoya, translated by Asa Yoneda. This is a short story collection. This is one that I feel like the author is way smarter than me, <laughs> which is probably the case in all the books that I read, but particularly in short story collections, um, there are always many layers to what's going on and there are some really enjoyable thought-provoking stories in here there's a couple that so these are all all of the stories in this book are told from the female's perspective i think i can't remember if they're all they're all relationships they may not all be married but they're all at least um in a in an established relationship told from the female perspective so there's one where the wife notices that the husband is starting, they're starting to look alike. Um, that one was really interesting. There's one, I think it's the last story in this where the, um, this woman is in this uh, like little, 
cottage or cabin or something like that kind of away from town a bit and there's all these dogs around her like like tons of dogs she doesn't lay down to sleep she's she sleeps standing up but she's like so surrounded by the dogs that she's like well supported and she can sleep there and then she goes to town and people are all like freaked out by the dogs it was really interesting but like I didn't get it so I ended up giving this three stars I I enjoyed it quite a bit but I just felt like I didn't get a lot of it and that's probably me and not not the book the writing was really interesting and fantastic the it took me quite a while to get through this I can't remember if I started this in January or February but the there is a long which let's see which there's there's one called an exotic marriage which is like 90 pages of a 200 book that's just over 200 pages so almost half of this book was one particular short story and what I like about short stories is I can typically you know sit down and within a half an hour I've read the whole short story I can do it in one sitting and because I knew that the next one was this like 90 page thing that either I was gonna have to really carve out a single chunk of time or I was gonna have to do it in a few smaller bits I just kept not picking it up because I knew that was what was coming next so I finally did um, I read that one and then it was probably a few weeks maybe until I picked it up again to, to oh doggy needs some love to to finish it off so not the best short story collection I've ever read but very interesting um, I would recommend it if you're yeah if you're looking for a short story collection this one is really intriguing and you know, maybe you're probably smarter than me, so you might um, you might get a lot more of the subtlety um, and the and the layers than I did. So I got sick about halfway through the month, um, just a cold, but it just kind of beat me down. And I had I was I had a, not much of a fever, but enough of a fever that I just felt like tired and and just like ugh, like I just no strength like. To lift up my arms was was too much was too much effort and I was in the middle of reading the Priory of the Orange Tree which I'll talk about last which is a huge chunker and I literally was like too weak to continue holding this book so I needed something lighter so although this may be lighter in physical size maybe not lighter in in context in content but this is where the red fern grows this is a middle grade novel i read this i think in fifth grade and as far as i remember this was the first book in the most recent book to make me cry so i remembered the i remembered basically the the crux of the ending i didn't remember how we got to the ending what the circumstances were but i was at least prepared because i i basically knew what the ending was but this is the story of billy who lives in the ozark mountains of oklahoma um, what was great for me personally is that my great grandparents are from Arkansas and Oklahoma and I remember, oh, hey Stevie, I remember uh, my great grandpa telling me stories about when he would go up into the hills uh, in the mountains of the Ozarks and he would cut down timber and um, he would have to take a shotgun out there with him to protect him from mountain lions and a lot of the description in this book just reminded me of my grandparents and their descriptions of uh, of their childhoods. So we follow Billy, who is the oldest of four kids, I think. He has he has like three or four little sisters, and he wants nothing more than to be a great coon hunter, that is raccoons, and he wants not one, but two amazing coon hounds. And so he finds out how much it costs to buy these coon hounds, and he does everything he can to save up money. This is a great book for teaching your children the value of hard work, the value of a dollar, how um, kind of the, the delayed gratification of working hard toward a long-term goal. And so we see Billy uh, work very hard, he says, for two years to get the money to buy these coon hounds. He has a very nice close relationship with his grandfather who runs the general store in town. His grandfather helps him to get these dogs, the, the logistics of it at least. And uh, and then he has his coon hounds, little Dan, no, big Dan and little Ann. And they are brother and sister and they are amazing. And Billy is great at training them. And 
Big Dan is the, the aggressive brute force guy. Little Anne is smart. She doesn't get in as many tussles and everything as Big Dan does because she's too smart for that. And so uh, they both have their, they both have their strengths and uh, Billy becomes kind of known in the area as he brings in the, the coon skins to be, to be sold at his grandfather's store. He's becoming known, he and his dogs are becoming known as great coon hunters. And so it is the story of that and um, what ends up happening um, in their lives. And it is a story of, as I said, the hard work and, and work ethic. And even, you know, when he gets the dogs, that's not the end of the work. He has, now he has to train the dogs and he's up early in the morning. He's out in the cold doing this because he wants to earn the money. He's helping out his family. And um, then we get to the point um, where we have some loss. And so if you are, you know, reading this with your children, your children are reading this in school, um, it's definitely a good conversation point and teaching moment as we have to deal with loss in life. So I'm interested I don't know. So I, when I read this in fifth grade, that would have been like the early 90s. I'm not going to do the exact math, 93-ish. And we were, we read this in my, uh, I was at a Catholic school at the time. This was written in, or published in 1961. And there are definitely some of the, there is definitely some of the timeness regarding gender and um, it might spark some interesting conversation um, in today's world regarding that. I actually, I remember just barely noticing it and thinking eh, that probably wouldn't fly today. Um, it was, there was nothing so glaring that it, it took me out of the story or, or bothered me anything, but I thought that would make for an interesting conversation point. You know, if you're a teacher or if you're a parent reading this book with children. Yeah. So I gave this four stars and it made me cry big time last up is the priory of the orange tree by samantha shannon so this big honker just over 800 pages the story itself is like 804 or five pages and then at the back we have a glossary and some several pages of character information note on that too so what was really nice about the the information regarding the characters we have human and non-human characters and what was really nice is that when you read the description of who someone is it wasn't spoilery at least i never encountered a spoiler in the first um, game of thrones book there's so many characters and trying to keep tra track of who is who and from what house and all that kind of thing and i remember being spoiled for something um, in the back of of that book um, and that didn't happen for me in this one. I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about this at um, by now. We have the East and the West and they have quite different cultures and it is quite like the East is like like the like Asia and the West is like the Western world essentially and the they are all members of what they call virtuedom. They follow the six virtues and they are all uh, basically against the nameless one who is this terrible dragon that had been basically put down um, at least for a thousand years and he is from the south. So in the east their dragons fly but they don't have wings they swim and they have some sort of organ on their head that allows them to fly and in the east they worship dragons. In the West, however, they um, are very fearful of dragons because of the Nameless One. Those dragons, basically all the dragons in the West are bad dragons, and the dragons of the East are good dragons. Stevie, you're gonna knock it over. Okay, dog just came through and knocked everything over, so hopefully we're in the same basic setup. So, everyone is against the Nameless One. The East and the West have different ideas about whether all dragons are bad or some dragons are good. In the East, they, they worship the dragons. The dragons are the gods. Um, their dragons are, at least. So we mainly follow four characters from both from the East and the West and how they interact with each other. And essentially, is the Nameless One going to come back? How is it that we are going to defeat him? 
can we stay divided as East and West or do they need to unite against their common enemy and look past their, their differences, stop calling each other heretics, um, and can they overcome this to defeat the nameless one? What I really loved about this book is that it is a fully realized world. So this is a, this is a standalone fantasy, 800 some pages. And with each of these cultures, we have their own religions. They have their own languages and customs and folklore and myths. And we get these little um, stories sprinkled out throughout the whole book, just bringing together this whole really rich world. And you understand the, the motivations and the history behind these people and their, and their people and why, why it is that they believe what they believe and how that affects the way that they're willing to go forward in the future. One thing I noticed is the women are badass in this. The women are, are just awesome. And I kept noticing that a lot of the men were feckless. So particularly when men are in the presence of women, it just seems that they're made to be like incompetent. And the women, I mean, it, so it's great that the women are strong and capable and all that. I just felt that it was a little bit man bashing. It, it was like man bashing without man bashing. Um, I don't remember there being anything blatant about it. I just noticed that the men just seem to never be able to accomplish anything on their own, um, at least not in, not in the same way that the woman would or that the woman is able to do uh, when she is present. I'm so happy I read The Priory of the Orange Tree, five stars, and I am looking forward to picking up The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon in the future. I almost forgot because I don't have a physical copy of it. Right the last couple days of the month, I listened to the audiobook of Exit West by Motion Hamid. So this is a story, um, Magical realism, but the magical realism aspect is is really just a, a plot device. It's not really there's we don't explore the magic of this of this at all that occurs. We have a couple who meets in a city of a country that is on the brink of civil war. Um, you get mid east Middle East vibes, but the country is never specifically stated. We get the idea at the beginning of how dire the circumstances. Um, become and they in increasingly are in survival mode. There's you know no power, they're stockpiling non-perishable food and things just get worse and worse. There are bombings, buildings are destroyed, you can no longer go to work because your work building doesn't exist anymore. And they start hearing rumors of these doors that take you other places. So this couple finds one of these doors and each time they find a door, they head somewhere west. So we end up traveling through multiple parts of the world, moving west each time. And this is a story of humanity, of people helping other people, of what do we really need in life and when our basic needs are met, how that can change our relationships. Are you in a relationship of, um, not convenience, but like necessity for companionship? Or are you with the person you're with because that's who you truly want to be with? I wish I had a physical copy of this book and I may end up getting it and rereading it. There were so many times where I would, I would hear a line and think if I had the physical copy of this book, I would underline that. It was just profound and moving and Again, this is another book that I know I'm not smart enough to have picked up on everything. Um, it was just really enjoyable and a real look at the human experience and having compassion for, for others. So these are the books that I finished in the second half of March. How was your March reading month? Have you read any of these books? Have you read The Priory of the Orange Tree? 
Talk to me down below in the comments. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. See you around the tubes.